Hi, welcome to M Squared, a channel where we're going to look at the unsung heroes in the history of science. Ruby Payne Scott was one of the first radio astronomers in the world, an excellent electrical engineer and a trailblazer for the workforce for women in Australia. Ruby was born on May 28th in 1912 in Grafton, northern New South Wales, to Amy and Cyril Payne Scott. She was a smart young child, and when she turned school age, she moved to Sydney to attend primary and secondary school, graduating with grades noteworthy enough to have her name mentioned in the Sydney Morning Herald. Her grades were awarded with not one, but two scholarships to the University of Sydney, where she began study before she even turned 17. She completed her Bachelor in Physics in 1933, and three years later she completed her Master's, with a thesis published, The Wavelength Distribution of the Scattered Radiation in a Medium Traversed by a Beam of X or Gamma Rays. She had spent her Master's working at the Cancer Research Institute there at Sydney University, and continued to work there after she finished her thesis. The research was to see if strong magnetic fields affected the development of chicken embryos there was a theory going around at the time that the magnetic field of the Earth affected people's health to the point where people would actually sleep, their bodies aligned to like the north-south magnetic field lines. Through her time there, she published a paper in Nature, but eventually the wider project wrapped up and she was out of work. She was only the third woman to earn a PhD in physics from Sydney University. There weren't too many job prospects for a woman with a physics degree in Australia in her day, and even for decades afterwards. So she earned a Diploma of Education and spent a little over a year teaching secondary school in Adelaide. Eventually she landed a role as a librarian for the radio manufacturer Amalgamated Wireless Australasia. However, her role quickly shifted into more technical research. In 1941, she left to begin work as an assistant research officer at the Division of Radio Physics at the CSIR, the predecessor of the CSIRO. Here she honed her skills as a radar operator during the war with top secret classified work. She had a knack for decoding confusing signals. Well, she's a bit loud and we don't think she's quite what we want and she may be a bit unstable, but we'll let her continue and see how she works out. Taffy Bowen, head of the division. After the war, the radar technology and experience of the team was redirected to academic ends. Joe Pawsey, their leader, uh, appointed Ruby Payne Scott as the head of science of the research team of what was then called solar noise research. One of the tricks that she had was to overlay two signals from two different sources and process them in a way that would essentially create an effect of having a detector the size of the distance between those two smaller detectors. This is called aperture synthesis, a type of Fourier analysis, all very mathematical and technical. Um, but it's certainly one way you can get more bang for your buck if you don't have a lot of equipment for a big telescope. She first developed sea cliff interferometry during the war at the Dover Heights radar facility on the cliffs in Sydney, splicing together the direct signal bounced off an enemy plane and the one reflected off the sea surface. It made the readings far more accurate and it gave her a good sense of how to clean up a signal from noise and tune the resolution and she carried these principles over to astronomy. Today, lots of observatories use aperture synthesis to make the detecting apparatus act much bigger than it physically is. Any array, like ASCAP over in Western Australia, or Keck on Mauna Kea, use this technique. And facilities can even team up to act as a telescope as big as the Earth, as a very long baseline interferometer, or VLBI. This is how the Event Horizon Telescope took that image of the black hole. Ruby Payne Scott performed the first detection of this kind on the 26th of January in 1946 at Dover Heights. She had no training in astronomy, but her experience with electrical engineering and just general physics gave her an edge over some of the more theoretically based training of the others in her team. There wasn't even much of a precedent at the time for non-military research of any kind in Australia at the time, so it was a big learning curve for everyone involved, the scientists and the admin. And even day to day, the equipment that they had was not built for purpose at all. She would worked out a lot of this calibration stuff from first principles as a radar technician. Um, 
And a lot of this stuff today is totally taken for granted by astronomers because it's all automated. The team doubled down on studying the sun, the strongest radio source that we can detect from Earth. Although that actually wasn't known at the time. It was the work of them and their colleagues overseas that actually discovered this fact. The Norfolk Island effect, massive radio detections at sunrise and sunset was being detected places other than Norfolk Island, the Cavendish Lab, at Cambridge University in the UK, as well as Dr. Elizabeth Alexander's team in New Zealand, and our girl in Sydney had all seen it. There were so many different phenomena coming off the sun, it was a really hard task to detangle and decode them all. There were signals that implied synchrotron radiation as well, and just the fact that synchrotron radiation exists at all was actually kind of contentious, especially in Australia. So. The whole thing was a friggin' mess. A paper, Radio Frequency Energy from the Sun, was published by Payne Scott's team in Nature in 1946. Further work showed a correlation between sunspots, how big their area is, and an increase in radioactivity. Uh, not, not radioactivity, but anyway. Two further papers came out in 1947. A study of solar radio frequency radiation on several frequencies during the sunspot of July-August 1946, and solar radiation at radio frequencies and its relation to sunspots. That second one was the most groundbreaking work that the team produced. They sent it over to the UK via airmail, but it still took six months to get there. Um, the tyranny of distance actually started to cause a bit of drama in the astronomy scene. Maybe it was some intervention from some bureaucrats over in the UK, because there was actually, you know, there was competition from the POMs at uh, Cambridge, and they produced a paper about the same phenomena. Their paper was actually written after the Australian team, but it was published first. Eventually the Australian paper arrived in the UK and was published in the Proceedings of the Royal Society of London. A paper from a team with no astronomers in it. <laughs> The cliffs of Dover Heights faced eastward, which makes early morning viewing quite easy. Nothing in the way, no light pollution, nothing. However, morning was about the only time you could make decent observations, which worked for some time and, well, you have to travel a long way to get to the west coast. Their research had outgrown the static detectors that rely on the rotation of the Earth to look around, in any case. It was fine for fairly consistent sources, but for whip-cracking fast solar bursts, it just wasn't cutting it anymore. Across town, in Potts Hill, next to the reservoir there, Ruby and co-worker Alec Little build a swept lobe interferometer. The thing took 25 images a second, and using the same overlay interferometry trick, it was able to pretend to be a much larger detector than it actually was. It only saw in one dimension, like a big slice of the sky, so motion had to be decoded and inferred from lots of different detections. The detector tech was cutting edge, but the, um, the record keeping was actually a bit rudimentary. They shot the oscilloscope with a film camera and developed the film on a light table. One of the phenomena that came to light uh, was massive solar bursts that were traveling at a thousand kilometers a second. These fast radio bursts are aeroplanes! Dumb Aussies, we see them too! Uh, Martin Ryle exactly saying those exact words, head of the Cavendish team at Cambridge. She shared her results with others and they laughed at her. But eventually her results were corroborated by others. Of the four types of solar bursts they discovered, she was the one who discovered types 1 and 3, and aided in the discovery of types 2 and 4. Threes were a little bit complex and mysterious, but the team wrote many papers on 1s and 2s, including relative times of arrival of bursts of solar noise on different radio frequencies, which was published in Nature in 1947. Type 1 are one second long, narrow frequency spikes from plasma and magnetic hotspots, sunspots. They can have a bunch of them happen over the course of a minute, but the mechanism is still to be determined. 
type 2 are dual harmonics, long-lasting and glissando sliding around, associated with coronal mass ejections. Type 3 are similar to 2, but slide their frequencies like 100 times faster, and they're associated with X-ray flares. Type 4 are a broad mash of frequencies, probably from synchrotron or plasma emissions. Martin Ryle credited Ruby Payne, Scott and co with the invention of aperture synthesis for a very long time, but then he sort of stopped doing that. In 1974, Martin Ryle won the Nobel Prize in Physics for his invention of aperture synthesis. Though he did refine the concept somewhat, there are rules, bylaws, that dictate the Nobel Prize Committee should award the discovery of invention of something to the first inventor or discoverer. But, I mean, 1974 was also the year that uh, Jocelyn Bell Burnell was snubbed as well, so hooray! Mm -hmm. She was a lifelong advocate for women in the workplace, a union member, and she also wrote lots of letters and things advocating for women. One of them being, uh, no, actually women shouldn't go back down to two thirds of a man's wage for the same job just because the war ended. No, thanks. She was politically engaged as well and sympathetic to left-leaning causes, so much so that ASIO, the Australian Security Intelligence Organization, had a file on Red Ruby. She actually was a member of the Sydney Communist Party, but uh, ASIO's file and investigations never came of anything. One day during 1944, she left work for a few hours. She came back from the registry office, a married woman. Um, she didn't tell anybody at the time because there were rules that a married woman would either be fired or be demoted after, you know, she didn't need to earn any money anymore. She's got the man for that. Admin was sticklers. However, her colleagues sort of worked out what was going on and they didn't care. She was even promoted to research officer from her assistant role uh, in 1946. During the shift from CSIR to CSIRO in 1949, the head Ian Clooney's Ross wrote a heated letter to Ruby about her and her position, her troublemaking about pay disparity between the men and women working there, and the policy discriminating against married women, but she clapped back. Married women in temporary positions are at a psychological disadvantage with their work. Present procedure is ridiculous and can lead to ridiculous results. You aren't supposed to just write to the head of the CSIRO in uh, those kinds of words. Um, eventually the admin did find out that she was married and shit hit the fan again. She was demoted to a temporary position stripped of her funding and her superannuation. In 1951, she resigned. She was pregnant and there was no maternity leave and no way for her to keep her job after giving birth and taking all that time off. So the career of one of the most influential and groundbreaking Australian astronomers of all time came to an ungracious end. She had two children, Peter Hall, a mathematician, and Fiona Hall, an artist. In 1952, she attended the URSI meeting, the International Union of Radio Science in Sydney. Though her career was over, she was still an incredibly valuable asset to the scene, and it was important for her to meet the international community and, more importantly, for the international community to meet her. Considering the pedigree and volume of her work, her contributions to astronomy at large, and the fact that it was all basically Nobel Prize worthy, it might seem really strange that she never actually earned a PhD, but it was only in 1948 that the first PhD was awarded in Australia to anyone from any field. So that was well into her career. After raising her children, she returned to teaching in 1963 at the Dane Bank School in southern suburban Sydney. She taught there for about 10 years, but in her early 60s she started to develop symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. Sadly, it's kind of early. Just shy of her 69th birthday in mid-1981, she passed away. In the last few decades, there have been a handful of commemorations to Ruby Payne Scott and her work and her life. In 2008, 
the CSIRO established the Ruby Payne Scott Award for new parents to cover travel for conferences and extended maternity paternity leave. Her old workplace, the school Dane Bank, has a yearly science lecture series from women in all fields of science. The University of Sydney has the honorary Payne Scott Professorial Distinction, and most prestigious of all, on what would have been her 100th birthday, Google had a doodle for her, elbowing out Aussie Literature Nobel Prize winner Patrick White, who would have also turned 100 that day. Australia, as an ancient landmass and as a modern country, has really deep ties to astronomy, and the strongest area of research is still radio astronomy. Ruby Payne Scott is quite well known in the astro field here in Australia, but it's a bit hard to tell if her renown spreads overseas. In any case, her work in astronomy, her electrical engineering acumen, and her advocacy for women in the workplace is a story that should be told over and over. Thanks for watching. I've put all of the references in the description. Uh, the Making Waves book is really good, so if you want to take a deep dive into her biography, I really recommend that one. Uh, if you like my art, don't forget to check out my Instagram and like and subscribe and smash that notification bell. See you next time.